months ago, I remember asking my dad at one point if there would be video games in heaven. And he said, no, there will not be video games in heaven. And from that point forward, I did not want to go to heaven anymore. And I mean, really, we had like Pong and Atari when you think of video games. And so often we can be connected to the things of this world. Jesus in the Gospel is saying, you see this temple, it's adorned and it's beautiful, it took 40 years to build and everything else. It's simply a physical thing. He goes on to say, your perseverance will save you and not a hair of your head will be destroyed. He didn't say we won't be hurt. But destruction, destroyed, means ended completely forever. And although the body can be destroyed, the soul is eternal. And it's by that perseverance that we will secure our very lives. During this month of November, we typically talk about the last four things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And it's not in a morbid sort of way as much as it is to try and get us back on track. We want to try to think about the last year and how maybe we haven't done all the things that we were supposed to do or, or how we've gotten off track or maybe we're not as spiritual as we should be. And to bear in mind that death is always before us. Most of us will not plan the moment when we die. And so that we always want to be prepared for that. We can have kind of a, a fear of it, obviously. Nobody likes to talk about death. And yet every one of us here has probably lost someone some point in your life, you know, whether it was a, a parent or brother or sister. I always kind of cringe when I get an email from the dean of students talking about the death of a parent. I think I'm not nearly ready to lose my parents, and I'm much older than many of you. And that stings. Any funeral we celebrate is really bittersweet. It's bitter because the person's gone, and you feel like they took a piece of you with them when they left. And yet it's sweet because everyone's crying. You only cry over someone whom you love and who loved you in return. And so to have had the experience of having such a person in our life was a wonderful gift from God. And no, we don't want to give them back, but certainly we hope to see them again one day. We listen to this first reading from the prophet Malachi, and it makes you fear God. God, you know, he says, we will, you'll be stubble. Those who have not been with me will be stubble. And that's because nothing that is sinful can come within the presence of God and live. That's why in the Catholic Church, we actually talk about the journey to God after we die as purgatory. There is a purging that occurs. Nothing can be within the presence of God and live that is evil. So we go through this purgation. And the nice thing about purgatory is it's not either going to hell or to heaven. It is the journey to heaven. It just takes some time. And there's this great fear about such a judging God. The psalmist today says, you know, the Lord will rule the, the earth. He comes to rule the earth with justice. And we think, oh, please, no. Because that's a horrible kind of justice. But think about this just for a moment. What if if the doctor approached you and said to you, you have 24 hours to live. That's it. You have 24 hours. What would you do in those 24 hours? I know some of you would say, well, I get a second opinion first. And maybe a third opinion. So let's presume this is the third opinion. It is definitive that you have 24 hours left. And that's it. What would we do? I doubt we would try to accumulate as many things as we possibly could before we went. Who would we speak to? Or who would we want to speak with us? What would we say? Or what would we hope to hear from them? Would we even want them to know that we only have 24 hours to live? Lest they come and it be like a 24 hour long funeral where people are just sad and grieving. What would we do? And we might think, well that metaphor is not applicable in most cases, and that's true. But the people on flights that crashed didn't think that they were going to die that day. Or people in car accidents, or any number of other things that happened, these calamities that were planned. People went to work, or they went to school, or they went on vacation, thinking that they have plenty of time to take care of all those things that we think we have plenty of time to do. 
And we're not saying to live every day as though it's your last day. In other words, do all these extreme things. But it's the same always be prepared. You see, God is the just judge who does not want to punish us. Any more than a, a mother who slaps her child's hand because he's reaching for a hot burner wants to hurt the child. It's just trying to get us on track that the Lord allows these things to happen to us, that we experience this suffering. And so God is not just one who is trying to get us all into hell. Remember, He created us out of love. And there's nothing we can do to diminish that love. Perhaps some of us, when we were growing up, you know, your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever it was, you got all A's on your report card, and they said, oh, you did so good, we're so proud of you, we love you so much. And then the next semester, you didn't do so well. And they said, you're grounded, or you're losing your phone, or you're doing... But they didn't say, also, we love you, or we are proud of you, or we break something, or we do something wrong. And we, we grow up beginning to think that when we do good things, we are loved, and when we do bad things, or we screw up, that we are not loved. And we apply that to God's love for us, which is really impossible. God's love cannot be diminished for us, which is a sadness for God because even those souls that are in hell, He still loves unconditionally as He did when He created them. They just refuse to love Him back. That is hell. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We walk freely into hell. Because we refuse to love God and live as, as we should, to bring us peace. When you think about this just judge, uh, it reminds me of a story. This man went to a wedding reception. And he didn't know anyone at this wedding except the couple. And finally, he zeroed in on someone he recognized. It was his third grade teacher. And so he gravitated to this teacher. And he said, hey, it's me, it's John. You remember me? And the teacher did not remember him at all. And he said, no, I was at the boys' school with you in New York, and it was my best class, third grade. You remember us? And he listed a few names who were in there. And the teacher said, I'm sorry, I, I've had a lot of classes. And he said to him, well, what do you do now? So you're all grown up, what do you do? And he said, I'm a teacher. And the teacher said to him, well, what inspired me, you to be a teacher? And he said, you did. You inspired me to be a teacher. In third grade is when I had my first real draw to be a teacher. And he said, well, what was it that I did that was so inspiring? He said, I can't believe you don't remember what happened. So it's back in third grade. And this kid came into class. He was rich. The rest of us, we didn't have money at all. But he had the first ever wristwatch. And when people saw this wristwatch, we all wanted it. So he went out to recess, and when he came back, the watch was gone. Someone had stolen it. And so you had us you know, stand up at our desks, and you say, I want that watch returned by the end of this day, or there's going to be trouble. We don't steal. That's not what we do. Well, it was about 10 minutes to the end of the day, and the watch wasn't returned. So then you told us to stand up. You walked over, and you locked the door. And you told us to face the blackboard and close our eyes. And we were to reach into our pockets and hold the contents behind our back so that you could check all of our hands. And you went on to say, if you didn't find the watch, that you would frisk us, that you would actually check our pockets, to be sure. And you went along. You, you stopped at each of us. And you found the watch. And at the end of the day, you got his watch back. And that was the last we heard. We never heard about it again. And the teacher looked a little befuddled. And he said, I can't believe you don't remember this. Because I was the one who stole the watch. And you never brought it up. You never said anything to me the rest of the year about it. It was never brought up. I wasn't punished. You didn't call my parents. Nothing. And I was so impressed by that. That you did not condemn me for that one stupid thing that I did. And I wasn't going to ever do it again. But that's what motivated me to be a teacher. I can't believe you don't remember this. And the teacher looked at him and said, the reason I don't remember is because I had my eyes closed as well. And 
And so when I went to each student to see what was in their hands, I didn't know which student I was looking at at the time. And therefore, I wouldn't look at them any different after this whole thing happened. That's the judgment of God. A God who is not reaching out to punish us, trying to help us to stay on the track that ultimately will bring us happiness. There are a number of occasions that I have been with a family member when they were going to announce to the rest of their family, their children, or whoever, that they have a terminal illness, that they will die. And it's always kind of, you can never predict what's going to happen, but it's always very profound and prayerful and emotional at times. But I've also been at the bedside of many people as they're ready to take their last breath. And as I go there to the bedside, I pray the same prayer all the time, so much so that, that I have memorized at this point. And it's a beautiful prayer. It's profound. It really puts into perspective that we do want to see our Creator. We do want to go to heaven. We do want to see all of our loved ones who are there among us. Someone once said, how do you know when you're ready to go to heaven? You're ready when you will be happy with Whoever you see there. Imagine that. Imagine getting to heaven and you think, now, how did he get here? I knew him in life. There's no way. No. We will be so happy for anyone who made it. That's when we know we're ready. And so I conclude with this prayer. Go forth, Christian soul, from this world. In the name of God, the Almighty Father, who created you from the dust. In the name of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who suffered and died for you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies you. Go forth, faithful Christian. May all the angels come to greet you today in the heavenly Jerusalem. May Mary, the mother of God, and Saint Joseph, and all the saints guide you on your way. May today, you meet your Redeemer face.